Servus and greetings from Vienna. My name is Anita Posch. Thank you for listening to Bitcoin und Co., my podcast that's introducing the philosophy, ideas and people behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Hello, friends. Thanks that you're here again, listening to a new episode of the Bitcoin and Co. podcast. Today's guest is Dan Held. He is the Director of Business Development for all products of Kraken. Kraken is one of the world's biggest and well-known cryptocurrency exchanges. Before that, he co-founded and developed products like ZeroBlock and Interchange. Both of that were acquired later on by other companies. In between, he served in the Rider Grove team at Uber. He lives and works in Silicon Valley. We met at the Baltic Honey Badger conference in Riga and discussed topics like the Bitcoin distribution, what he finds surprising about Satoshi Nakamoto's ideas, a possible Bitcoin super cycle that's in the making and much more. You can find all recommendations and the links we are talking about on the episode page at Bitcoin and co.com forward slash en forward slash dan hyphen held. Don't miss the upcoming interviews and subscribe to the show in your podcast player now. Before we start, I want to thank my sponsors. Without their support, this podcast would simply not be possible. And they have great products and services too. So please listen to their messages and afterwards enjoy. I approached Shift Crypto Security because I feel like we care about the same things. My absolute belief is in independence. This is a value that drives all of Shift's products too. We both believe that everybody should be the holder of their own keys. And a well-built hardware wallet is the safest way to hold your coins. So when Shift announced the Bitbox 02, we made it happen. The Bitbox O2 is Swiss-made, secure and easy to use. It has invisible touch sensors and USB-C. And it also comes as a Bitcoin-only edition. That's something I believe in too. So I encourage you to check it out at shiftcrypto.ch. That's shift, C-R-I-P-T-O dot C-H. And you can get free shipping with the code ANITA. The Bitbox O2 by Shift Crypto Security. Paying with cryptocurrencies in everyday life and that with any wallet? Salamantex makes it possible now. Cheap, fast and easy, at the checkout or online. All Salamantex merchants and further information about the Salamantex digital payment system can be found at www.salamantex.com forward slash customers. That's www.salamantex.com forward slash customers. So hello, Dan. Thanks for taking the time to do this interview with me here at the beginning of the Baltic Honey Badger Conference. Have you been here before? I haven't been to Riga or the Honey Badger Conference yet. Um, it's uh, I, it's pretty exciting. I haven't spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, and so it's been awesome hanging out here with Bitcoiners and and you know walking around the city and really getting a good feel for it. But you are at a lot of conferences, I guess. <laughs> I do travel to a lot of conferences. Uh, not not often do I go to a really kind of cool new location like Riga, Latvia, though. Normally, it's more New York City or San Francisco where I live or Chicago or something like that. So this is this is kind of fun for me. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, delve in a little bit on your bio. Your Twitter bio says you're now the Director of Business Development at Kraken. That's, yep, yeah. that's right. And uh, previously, you were at Interchange, or that's a product you designed or built. That's right. Yeah. So we built, uh, me and two other co-founders built Interchange. Interchange did post-trade reconciliation for large institutional traders. So you could imagine um, if you're a crypto hedge fund and you're trading across many different crypto assets on many different exchanges, we help you with the accounting issues that you have trying to figure out your cost basis and how much you made and lost. 
And so we built software that works between a crypto hedge fund and their, uh, a crypto hedge fund accountant called the fund administrator. And then we got bought by Kraken about two months ago because Kraken sees us as kind of a really useful tool that they can have provide value for uh, internal processes and also uh, kind of be really synergistic externally with the rest of Kraken's products. So the crypto hedge funds that use our tool, you know, Kraken, uh, their other exchange products and OTC products are very complementary to that uh, for those type of customers. Mm -hmm. And your field of work has now changed, like you also do business development for Kraken, or are you working for Interchange? Yeah, great question. So uh, when they brought me on board, they wanted me to focus on all Kra uh, all Kraken products. So I'm working on, um, you know, I'm, I'm director of BD for all Kraken products. Okay, I understand. And it seems that you're a person who likes to build new stuff and then sell it to others. Is this <laughs> it's because it's, it says in your bio like you you did like um, you were acquired by blockchain and then you know with the Kraken uh, yes yeah <laughs> this is my second crypto acquisition so yeah, um, yeah it, it's I like to build pro you know I like to build build solutions for problems that I think are really critical uh, the first product that I built was zero block. And at that time, there was no mobile app in crypto in 2013 that gave you the real-time price of Bitcoin. So you can imagine with the price being really volatile, people were really you know, thirsty to find a product that could solve that need. Similarly, in 2017, accounting became a really big issue with all the complexities with all these different cryptocurrencies that were being traded. And so I felt like both of those products were something that I personally had a pain point with, and I decided to go build And then later found a really good fit at two different companies to acquire that product. So I've been, it's, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, because if you say ride, you also were at Uber. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we didn't set that up. That was just off, off yeah, no. <laughs> to all the listeners that was, that was in the flow here. But uh, yeah, Uber was a fun time. You know, I think during uh, 26, so I joined Uber in January 2016 and stayed there through November 2017. And I joined Uber, Uber, Uber because at that time, there wasn't a lot to do in Bitcoin and crypto. In 2016, it was very quiet and we weren't sure when trading was going to come back. And I wanted to go progress professionally and learn from some of the best people in the world how to build great products. And I found that at Uber where I worked on writer growth um, under Andrew Chen, who's now a GP at Andreessen Horowitz. So I worked with some magnificent people that were really sharp. I learned a lot. I learned how to communicate much more effectively, uh, which a lot of my writing in Bitcoin has been influenced through processes at Uber that were required. For example, at Uber, you were required to write a TLDR on emails, a too long didn't read. So you had to always compress your narrative really, really tightly and make it easy to understand. And I think that's reflected in my writing. You just said you went to Uber in between doing stuff for Bitcoin. When did you realize that Bitcoin is something of interest? 2012. 2012. 2012 was when I first found Bitcoin and my uh, my friend paid me back for a beer with a Cassatius coin. Those those shiny gold coins you see on those in all those news articles, that's that's a Cassatius coin. And so that was kind of a nice way to bridge the physical to digital world for me in 2012. And then I started to read up on the monetary policy and then I found out people could buy illegal things online with it and that kind of sealed the deal for me because it wasn't that I was excited about the drugs themselves. It was that someone could. And that meant that the protocol was robust and strong enough that people could use it for illicit activities, which meant it was free. It was truly free. And that's, I'm, I'm a big proponent of freedom. And so as a libertarian, and so Bitcoin demonstrated that through Silk Road. And I thought that was amazing. And then the 21 million hard cap, the monetary policy is a brilliant breakthrough in uh, economics. So I felt that was equally as interesting to me as well. And also that there's no possibility to change it, actually. Precisely. Yeah. Or that the social consensus around the 21 million hard cap is so intense that it's extremely unlikely that it would ever change. You know, as I started to write and I went deeper down the rabbit hole of each individual topic over Bitcoin's initial distribution or proof of work or Bitcoin's origin story um, or what role hodlers play in the ecosystem, it, it was fascinating to, you know, go down these rabbit holes. And the more and more I went down these rabbit holes, the more and more I fell in love with Bitcoin. I always loved Bitcoin and found it incredibly fascinating, but the depth that it has is is so deep that I, it kind of blew me away. I thought I knew a lot about Bitcoin and then I realized I didn't. Your name on Twitter is Hedl. 
I mean, you're called Held, <laughs> but it's Hedel. Yes, yeah. I suppose it's because you hodl. I think I was born to hodl. <laughs> if you have a last name of Held, I think. <laughs> born to hodl, that's a great uh, thing for <laughs> I should have a shirt. You have yeah. just hodl it on yeah, your just shirt. Hodl, I am wearing a just hodl it shirt right now. Yep. <laughs> But don't you think that we also ha have to spend some uh, Bitcoin to get it into an, a circular economy of Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think a lot of people back, especially in 2013 and 2015, felt that a circular Bitcoin economy was necessary. Um, you know, I think if we look at gold, we don't necessarily see that happening. So gold's worth $7 trillion dollars, and there's nowhere I can go spend it. And so gold is still very functional as a store of value. Now, Bitcoin has some interesting characteristics as a money that make it much easier than gold to spend because it's electronic. Uh, you can divide it into much, much easier, more granular units. Um, it's, fun it's, it's easily uh, verifiable to where gold is super hard to verify. So this makes Bitcoin much easier to use as a, tra as a, a method to pay for things than gold would be. So I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I just think at this stage in Bitcoin's evolution, it's much more useful as a speculative store of value. Um, later down the line, when the price stabilizes and you know there's, let's say, a half a billion to a billion Bitcoin users, then merchants and users might consider using it for payment because I'm not going to go, you know, if the price is more volatile than my local fiat currency, then that's kind of a headache for me to keep that as my unit of account because my loaf of bread will be 20 sats one day and 100 sats the next day. And that's really hard for people to, to really understand that. And so I think once the price stabilizes in like a hyper-Bitcoinization, post-hyper-Bitcoinization, that makes it much more useful as that payment method. And I, I definitely think we will pay for everything in Bitcoin eventually. It just at a very much, very, very later date. And also, you know, the, the reason why we need a user base of like half a billion to a billion for it to start to be used as a payment method is because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna walk down to my my local grocery store and then my coffee shop and my bar and only one out of ten of them accept Bitcoin. That's a very frustrating process. I use my payment methods because I know 99% of the time it's going to be accepted. Yeah, but you say half a billion users. How much users do we have now? Do we have an <laughs> estimate? I mean, the estimates are all over the place, but between 20 and 40 million, I think is a good one. Mm -hmm. Unique users. So it will actually take a long time, to be honest, huh? A couple cycles. Now, I do think there might be a Bitcoin super cycle coming up, but that's a bit of a controversial thing. the halving or? Yeah, so the halving, you know, post-halving, we, we've seen the last two bull markets happen post-halving. Um, so we're, we're on the precipice of another one in around May 2020. But I think that the backdrop in which this happening event is occurring, the macro backdrop, the, the backdrop of the world economy is much different than the other happening events. You know, we're at a moment where the president of the United States, Donald Trump, is tweeting at the Federal Reserve to print more money, which is crazy. Um, so I think Bitcoin, if accepted by institutional traders as a risk-off trade or a safe haven asset, If that becomes the narrative in the year 2020, 2021, we might see Bitcoin not go through a normal market cycle. We might see it go through a super cycle. And this ties back to the user metrics because in a traditional cycle, you know, Bitcoin 10x is and the number of users 10x and the number of transactions 10x. Uh, a lot of the, you know, all these usage metrics around the protocol are based on these, these market bull, boom and bust cycles. But in a super cycle, we might see it move from you know, 20 to 40 million users to a billion versus 20 to 40 million users to half a billion. Is the technical infrastructure made for a super cycle yet? Yeah, you're talking like on-chain scaling. Yeah, on-chain or off-chain. I mean, like yeah. lightning or not, yeah. That's that's a great question. Um, you know, in a store of value gold 2.0 singular use case, I think it's more than ready. Now, in an everyday merchant payment, I, I don't think the user experience around Lightning is is ready yet to onboard that many users. Um, I do think the price elasticity of a transactor on layer one is quite high. So the worry is, okay, if we onboard a billion users into Bitcoin, using it to hodl and store value, you know, will that make transaction fees go up? The answer is yes. Um, there's a limited amount of block space and people are, there's more demand for that block space. So people have to bid higher and higher. Um, but, If we look at what people are willing to pay to move other stores of value, I think we're going to be okay. 
Um, even if the if the fee is ten dollars or fifty dollars, people regularly spend you know twenty to eighty dollars in the United States to wire money. Physical gold delivery requires insurance, uh, certain types of shipping methods. Um, you've got you know real estate transactions, which real estate is a two hundred and fifty trillion dollar store value asset, and those closing costs for a real estate transaction are enormous in the thousands of dollars. And then offshore banking to set up an offshore bank account is thousands and thousands of dollars. It sounds like you might think that the institutions will come in earlier than the uh, regular people. Well. You know, Bitcoin has largely been a retail trade so far, uh, but the institutional money could could be the one that thrusts it into a super cycle. I think that's the the difference here, and I think it's a mixture of both. I don't think it's singular, just institutions. I think their capital flows will make it be a much bigger cycle than it was before. But I think that increasing price, as we've seen in other bull markets, which you know, I got to admit, in 2013 when I saw that bull market, that got me really, really into Bitcoin. These speculative bull runs bring about bring about greater awareness to Bitcoin, which brings around greater users and people that want to, you know, people come for the trading and stay for the sound money. And so, I think if it's an institution-led sort of sort of if if you see institutional volumes really skyrocket, that that price movement will draw in retail as well. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of institutional money, I mean, you're you're living and working in San Francisco, so Silicon Valley is a thing. You were at Uber <laughs> and stuff, yeah. and you, I, I guess you know a lot of people there. What is Silicon Valley waiting for? I mean, no, not, <laughs> no none of these big uh, companies uh, uses Bitcoin. Well, we got Square. What, what do they do? Yeah, Square, yeah. <laughs> Square is a big one. You know, Silicon Valley has been a frustrating, it's been frustrating to watch Silicon Valley over the last few years. Um, they largely don't understand Bitcoin at all. Um, they view it as just a technological play and they completely ignore everything around economics or money, which is kind of silly because it's all three. Um, but Bitcoin's innovation wasn't necessarily the code itself. It was the, it was taking the code and putting it all together to enable a incentivizations and to enable certain types of interactions between humans, sort of minimizing trust. And the code itself is, you know, kind of snippeted from like pretty old ideas. Bitcoin wasn't, there was, the code is, and Satoshi even made errors with the code itself. The real innovation was, you know, proof of work and like having that be functional. Um, and then, you know, proof of work not only protects the network, but it mines new coins and new coins and is responsible for the unforgeable costiness of those new coins, which is an ethical money production. So these things are completely ignored by Silicon Valley. Um, they view proof of work as a wasteful environmental hazard, which is kind of ridiculous because it's more about physics than it is about code. It's about provably burning energy, which is a good thing. Um, so Silicon Valley fundamentally does not understand Bitcoin. That's why the, they funded so many of the different uh, coins, especially the ICOs during the boom. Uh, San Francisco was the hub. Uh, that in Asia were kind of the hubs of ICOs. So, you know, I don't think Silicon Valley will mentally ever get there. Um, I think you'll sort of see Bitcoin just get adopted by Silicon Valley companies, but Uh, you know, and you, I think you'll see like companies like Square make it a first class citizen, but it might just be in the background of everything that we see. Like Bitcoin will just kind of pervade, you know, kind of like invade these different products, but we just may not see it. Yeah, but I mean, Facebook wants to build its own currency. But yeah. we, I mean, we will see if it works out. Or... Yeah, well, they're they're learning what reputation means. Um, when your reputation's poor, then people are going to be kind of critical of your actions. So when Facebook launches a coin, and I don't think I'm going to use that for privacy, right? <laughs> and I, I think I applaud what they're doing because they're kind of forging the way for the rest of us and dealing with all this regulatory flack. So they're taking on all this criticism and they further differentiate Bitcoin because people sometimes think Bitcoin's just about like merchant payments or that Bitcoin's just this digital currency. It's much bigger than that. And Libra will show that Bitcoin... The value in it is its immutability. It's the fact that no one controls it. It's the fact that we don't have to trust a Facebook. We don't have to trust a government. And so I think Libra might help further differentiate Bitcoin's value prop. 
Yeah, and I hope that it raises uh, questions of privacy. Yeah. But I, I fear that most people, like say mainstream or the 80% or say it as you wish, um, they don't get it. They don't really care about their privacy, I think. Yeah, that's right. I think what they care more about is preserving wealth. So Bitcoin as a store, store of value, I think will be the main value prop. And privacy with Lightning and other things might be better later, but you're right. People don't take the necessary steps to enable their privacy. Yeah, for other I mean, maybe I'm unfair because in the countries where you don't have enough uh, money or a lifestyle that we have, they don't care about privacy, I guess. They care about stable money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like in, in uh, Argentina, um, you know, they use US dollars because it's stable. It's a stable unit of account. Yeah. But Zimbabwe just has uh, banned the US dollar. <laughs> they are not allowed to use the US <laughs> good, dollar anymore. Good luck, good luck banning that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, I think people people will always try to find a way to preserve their wealth. Yeah, sure. But, uh, I mean, on the other hand, uh, Facebook and Libra would have a uh, big, big uh, power in small countries because they have more money than the countries have. Right, yeah. But Libra will try to challenge the sovereignty of the state. And that's where I'd, I'm pretty pessimistic on if they're going to be able to launch in some of these countries because, you know, people forget that al almost almost the whole world is on mobile. And mobile is controlled by two app stores, Google Play <laughs> and the App Store. And Google, at least with uh, Android devices, you can sideload an APK. So you can download an APK or an app like, like an app directly, and you don't need the App Store. But with Apple, you definitely need the App Store. And at Uber, I headed up App Store optimization to where I owned, I owned the relationship with App Store, the Apple App Store and Uber, uh, the relationship between the two companies. So Uh, good luck uh, if you want to, you know, these countries will lobby Apple to ban the apps and Apple does that all the time. Apple's banned like VPN products in China and Russia, so they would easily do that. Before we continue, a short message from my longtime show supporters at Card Wallet. Thank you. We'll be back soon. Do you want to keep your Bitcoin safe long term? The Card Wallet is the best cold storage solution a retail customer can get. It's easy to use and completely offline. No hassles with updates, passwords or hacks. I gave one to friends as a wedding gift. They are Bitcoin newbies. But with the Card Wallet, even they can hold Bitcoin securely. And the best thing is, my friends at cardwallet.com made a special offer for all the listeners of my podcast. If you go to www dot cardwallet.com forward slash Anita, you'll get 20% off the price. So go to www.cardwallet.com forward slash Anita now and buy a card wallet with a 20% discount. And do you think that it's really not possible for countries or governments to uh, like regulate or forbid Bitcoin? Yeah, I think it's, you know, we've, I, I just don't, They can try, but I don't see it being successful. We've got two examples of why it, it won't. One is like, for example, drugs or marijuana. You know, every government, a lot of the governments in the world try to ban it, but banning it didn't really stop it from being consumed or used. Uh, same with the uh, US prohibition where we, the US banned alcohol. We see that those methods aren't effective, um, especially if there's utility, aka fun or value that people find from it. Um, And storing wealth is an incredibly strong motivator for people. So I don't see those laws or rules really being, especially in a moment when, when, when people need it the most, the people at the IRS, the people at all these, all these US agencies, they'll be buying Bitcoin. So if, if they're feeling the pain enough to where they try to ban it, the people within the government will be buying Bitcoin to preserve their own wealth. Um, and then at the same time, we've never seen every government across the world coordinate all at once. We see this with global warming, for example, It's that all the governments in the world can't come to come together on what is a publicly popular issue. They can't come together on that. So why would they come together on an issue like Bitcoin, which let's put it this way, if they're trying to come together all to, get, to ban Bitcoin, it means that their citizens really want to get their money out of their countries. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not going to be a very popular method. <laughs> Let's come to another topic. You wrote an article about the Bitcoin distribution because there is one set of arguments, like one argument that's always, oh, there are a little, a small hand of people who get rich, rich, rich with Bitcoin because they were f they are first. So, and many people say, I don't 
want to use Bitcoin because I don't want to like help them. And right. I also, I cannot get that rich anymore. So I'm not interested. <laughs> you know, people were saying that when Bitcoin is at $10. <laughs> uh, that's interesting yeah they still thought, say it yeah they still say it now which i find is really funny i've been in the space for a long time and i've heard that at ten dollars hundred dollars thousand dollars ten thousand dollars and they're going to say that at a hundred thousand at a hundred thousand dollars but i'll let you in on like a little little dirty secret of bitcoin ogs not a lot of them hodled the whole way i mean when you hundred x or a thousand x a lot of people feel like selling now some people really believed we've got like the trace myers of the world who he evaluates all of his investments based on the return of Bitcoin. <laughs> so, so he's a hardcore hodler. <laughs> he's way in. But, you know, I know some OGs that are really well known uh, that sold like all their Bitcoin at $10. Yeah. And also some of them have, have lost it. Yeah. Some of them have lost it. I mean, oh, I know so many people. I know another OG who Bitcoin was only worth like pennies at the time. So he had 100 Bitcoin on his hard drive and he didn't want to sync. He didn't want to like boot up the Bitcoin QT wallet and deal with some issue that he needed to do to enable to move the coins. And so he's like, ah, I'm just going to wipe my hard drive. Yeah. Cause you, yeah because you know. <laughs> it wasn't worth anything back then. Yeah, and nobody believed it. that it yeah. would be worth so much. Totally. And, and you've got like coins that have been sent to like wrong addresses and bad private key management. I mean, just to hodl this long you know, without like you know, having your money on an exchange that got hacked, not sending your coins the wrong to the wrong address, not not losing your private key, not buying into an investment opportunity that was terrible, not buying altcoins. I mean, very few people stayed totally pure on that path. So I would say there's probably very few big, big, big hodlers. And most of those were like early miners, you know, the guys who mined when Bitcoin wasn't worth anything. Those are the ones who have like the biggest chunk of coins. Versus like, you know, once Bitcoin had a price, then it became much more expensive to acquire. Yeah. The title of your article is the Bitcoin distribution is fair. Yes. And I think one of your thoughts is also that those people invested also in products and in Bitcoin projects. Yeah. With any capitalist endeavor, you have to risk capital. So you risk capital to, with a hypothesis, you might make money. And so some of these early, these early, early miners who mined Bitcoin when it wasn't worth anything, technically were, were taking a loss because coins weren't worth anything. They were using energy and they had bought graphics cards and they had no idea if it was ever going to be valuable. So they're, they're well rewarded for that risk, which anyone else in the world could have taken the exact same risk they did. Yeah, I think it's the same with like, yeah, risking capital for building Facebook or any other company. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, these people, and that's where proof of work is so beautiful, is that the only way to get Bitcoin is either to put in the proof of work or to earn money in other methods and then buy Bitcoins from people who did the proof of work. Or earn Bitcoin, work or, in the yeah. industry and <laughs> try to earn it. <laughs> the, the only, yeah, there, there is no free lunch. And that's what makes Bitcoin so incredibly fair. And that's why I'm attracted to it is that no one printed their own coins. There wasn't like a committee that allocated coins to someone politically. Nope. Everyone had to work for it. And it's uh, like a, a, a root development because like I think one and a half years, nobody worked at it. I mean, Satoshi. Yeah. I mean, Sato look, Satoshi didn't know if anyone was going to come help him with this, right? I mean, that's why he published his email to the cryptographer mailing list is he's like, hey guys, I made this new thing. Want to come work on it? And it's funny to look at it in retrospect. You know, now we're sitting at like a conference with a thousand people. Um, but Satoshi didn't know. And so, you know, for the first little while he was mining by, you know, it was like him and Hal Finney or maybe Hal Finney Satoshi, uh, you know, mining, mining Bitcoin and hoping others join. And, uh, you know, eventually more and more hash rate came on and then more and more developers started to tinker with it. And then it got listed on an exchange, which was a, you know, Mt. Gox stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. Mt. Gox was an exchange for trading cards. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it, it, Bitcoin was birthed or the, the seed of Bitcoin fell into the weirdest corner of the internet and blossomed from there. And, uh, you know, everyone who risked their capital to either mine, buy, build companies totally deserve whatever value was received because they all put in the proof of work in one way or another. You just said, uh, Helfini, uh, I don't know if you have seen it on Twitter, but I'm part of the team Satoshi 
uh, Vito Stella organized the Run for Helfini last oh, week. Oh, the, the running campaign. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. That's we, awesome. Yeah, we also did the um, Satoshi Friathlon, which was a 357 kilometers run and cycle wow. and swim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys are way more active than I am. <laughs> yeah, we try to. I mean, um, the, the Vitus and the other guys, they are even harder than I do. I'm only swimming and cycling. But yeah, we <laughs> thought we thought it, or he thought it's a good idea to make, um, create positive awareness for Bitcoin because, you know, he was thinking of like, if a company wants to build good reputation, then they do sports marketing. Yeah. And so that was his idea. I like it. I, you know, it's kind of funny. I think we, we, uh, we think alike because uh, I was just down in L.A. with Russell Kung, the uh, NFL, the National Football League football player, American football player. And so, he, you know, similarly, we think that like sports and like being a, a positive image around Bitcoin is good for it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with that. Yeah, I also heard that for those international players, Bitcoin is actually a, a, the ide ideal form of payment because they travel around the world or work in oh, different yeah. countries and then it's much easier to earn Bitcoin than do the international payment transactions. Yeah, that could be. I, I could see that happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, one last question. I think you researched uh, Satoshi's email list and stuff very intense. I did. I, I spent a little time digging deep, deep into Satoshi's earliest writings. Yeah. Was there something that surprised you, especially? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, that's, you know, well, <laughs> uh, I, guess, I, guess, I guess a few things, you know, one is where he put the decimal place, like why 21 million Bitcoins yeah. <laughs> versus 21 billion. I find that interesting. And also if, you know, people have asked me, do you think Satoshi's ever made a mistake? And I actually use that as what I would subjectively view as a mistake. Because uh, I think Satoshi, he wasn't sure if this experiment was going to work. I think he wanted to see Bitcoin break dollar parity sooner than later, so it would become real to people. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I've seen the effect on the user experience side where people are like, wait, I can, I can buy a part of a Bitcoin. You know, so I think <laughs> I find that choice interesting because he must have thought about that. Like, okay, as the value rises, um, you know, you can hit a 20, you know, well, it depends on how many Bitcoin were mined, but, uh, you know, you could hit, you know, like maybe 10, 15 million market cap pretty fast. Uh, and even a 20 billion market cap isn't that crazy. So to see him put the decimal where he was, I think that's an, a weird choice. Um, I think Hal Finney's response to Satoshi in the email chain was suspiciously optimistic. So <laughs> a couple of weeks after Bitcoin launches, so to, uh, Hal Finney, sorry, Hal Finney goes, oh yeah, I think Bitcoin could maybe hit $10 million of Bitcoin. And I'm like, wow, that's really bullish, Hal. Interesting, uh, you know, really extremely optimistic take when everyone else in the email threads like, eh, I don't know if it's going to work or this doesn't make sense to me. Hal was uh, suspiciously optimistic. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations for listeners for books to read or videos to look about Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Nick Carter's got some awesome articles. Uh, you know, he writes a little bit more eloquently. So it's going to be, um, you know, if you want something a little bit more basic, I would recommend VJ. Uh, VJ wrote the bullish case for Bitcoin. And that's kind of a good A to Z, um, you know, primer of like, okay, what, what, what about the monetary system? You know, what's happened over the last thousand years? Why is Bitcoin valuable and how does it work? And VJ's article, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, does, I think, a really good job of that. Uh, there's also the Little Bitcoin book that just came out by Alex Gladstein, Alina Satoshi. Uh, she's over at CASA, and then Alex is with the Human Rights Foundation. They wrote an awesome book on kind of a little primer as to what Bitcoin is and why it matters. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And where can people follow you? You can follow me on Twitter at, at Dan Held. My name on Twitter is Dan Heddle, but the Twitter handle is Dan Held. And um, also on, on my website, you can read my blogs, my, my blog, which is danheld.com. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for your time and have a good day here. Oh, thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye. So thank you for listening. And please remember to check out the Bitbox 02 hardware wallets. Free shipping with the code ANITA at shiftcrypto.ch. Two editions, both Swiss made, including a Bitcoin only. What can I say? I'm a fan. And thanks also to Card Wallet and Salamantex. 
That's it for today. Thank you for listening. What did you think of the interview? Did it bring you greater understanding of Bitcoin and its people? If yes, and if you want to support my show, please subscribe to the podcast in your player, leave some stars and share, 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 share on social media. Feel free to contact me on Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube or send me a voice message via the link on the episode page. Goodbye from Vienna. Auf Wiederhören. Music. Start with Yes. Delicate Beats. Idea, Content and Production. Yours truly, Anita Posch. <laughs>